Good afternoon, Zoe. Hi, Genevieve. So this is our last day together. I know. Where has the semester gone? It really did fly by. It really did. You are two weeks away from graduation. Yes. I'd love to start this conversation to hear a little bit about what did you think speech pathology education would be? And did it live up to that? Did it change? Did it, you know, how did it end up? Talk, talk to us a little bit about the training. Because I think okay. so many folks are curious about it, right? You go to a, th a clinician, whoever it might be, and, mm -hmm. and they're there and they have skills. But I don't think people understand the process. So yeah. give them a little insight. Okay. So my experience might be a little bit different just because I did it online through NYU's online master's program. But basically the first two years were us in the classroom learning, having lectures. We had some experiences where we had a lot of guest speakers come in. And that was really cool because the speakers were from all different like walks of speech pathology. So we had people who specialize in swallowing, feeding, aphasia, dysphagia, articulation, you know, just all types of different settings that people worked in, which was great because I felt like me going in, I had experience working with speech pathologists prior to the program. And it was people who worked in feeding and then also worked in the school setting. And I had no idea which setting was going to be right for me. So it was great, like being able to have people come in and kind of just feel out, even within our courses, like feel out which area felt right, which area I felt most comfortable with. So I love that part of it. And then the my third year was when I had my practicum experiences. So I was Place, I live in Atlanta, so my placements were here in Atlanta. My first semester was at a private practice, pediatric. So I got to see that part of speech, working with children as young as, I don't know, 12 months, even a little bit younger, all the way up to 18. And then my second semester, I was still with pediatrics, but I was in a school setting. So it was a little bit different. The kids were a little bit older, so at least preschool through fifth grade. And then my third semester, is it was supposed to just be adults. And there was like some hiccups. And so that's how I ended up getting placed with you a couple of days a week. And I was doing a pediatric placement as well, like at the same time. So mine was a little bit different. There were some people in my program who ended up with the same situation, but it, it worked out because I love my placement with you learning about aphasia. So, yeah. Nice. So I didn't prep you for this, but what mm -hmm. did you think about working? Because this is really the first time intensively you were working with the aphasia population. Yes. Where did it start? Where did it end? What are your... As a clinician, what are your mm -hmm. impressions and thoughts? So I was a little nervous working with adults in general, because even before my program, I've only ever worked with children. So I knew it was going to be an adjustment in that respect. But I think my program, and I'm sure a lot of other speech programs, really did discuss aphasia in depth. So I felt comfortable with the knowledge aspect. Mm -hmm. I just had to learn how to apply that when I'm actually seeing clients. And it really is different with children. You know, there's a lot of bells and whistles and colors and pictures and, you know, things that you use for right. children. And so with adults, what, what I really enjoyed was being able to have conversations and talk and learn about, you know, their lives just in a different way than you can with kids. That was my number one reason for working with adults. Mm. When I started my undergrad, I, I met 
a speech pathologist who specialized in esophageal speech. He worked with the laryngectomy population. Oh, so wow. That was my first exposure. And all these folks had a new lease on life and they were turning over a new leaf. They had to change some of their health choices yeah. now that they had their voice box removed, usually due to cancer. And they had a story to tell and they wanted to share it. And that exactly. inspired me to work with adults just in general. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I was able to have the opportunity because I think if it hadn't been a requirement to do pediatric and adult, I probably would have just stuck with what I was comfortable with, which was children. So I'm, I'm grateful for the experience. My grad school did not expect did they no you could have stayed all kids you could oh, have wow. stayed all kids the whole time although i was i want to say required i could probably have chosen not to do mm. an internship in like a school district okay but yeah it wasn't my it wasn't my gig it's the, right <laughs> the adults for me Talk to me about telepractice. Where do you think the advantages, disadvantages of telepractice with the aphasia population? Well, I think telepractice is great for people who are invested and because if you don't if you don't want to do something, if you don't want to do teletherapy, if you don't want to do therapy at all, then I don't think teletherapy is the right setting for you. Like it it's just not, you have to be invested. You have to want to be there. And I think with, especially the aphasia clients that we've had, they want to be here. And that's a huge part of it. I think that's like a really big step in the first place, just wanting to be there. But I think it's great because there's been clients that I know you've talked about seeing when they were out of town or on vacation and you were still able to get that therapy time in with them. So I think it's great. Meet people where they are. I love that. I do think teletherapy is not for everybody. And I actually appreciate it as, I hate to use the term barrier for entry, but it mm. helps kind of differentiate those that are doing therapy because their family wants them to do therapy versus those that are invested. I think that was the word you used. They're motivated. They are there for a reason to get something out of it. So right. I, I think when I teach telepractice to a variety of clinicians, whether it's adults or kid focused, that, that kind of doesn't matter. But teletherapy allows me to work with those that are super motivated. Because you know the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And right. when I used to do home therapy, we had to go see everybody and you had mixed results based on their motivation. That makes sense. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So you had to do a project for yes. finishing your semester. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? Yeah. And you know, tell us and then get into the meat of it. Tell us what you learned and how that knowledge might serve you outside of just the aphasia population. Yeah. So my project was about verbal working memory with the aphasia population. And I chose that because a lot of the therapy that I've done with the, my aphasia clients was using verbal working memory. So as a task, so it was cool because it was something that I was able to incorporate into so many different tasks with different clients and meeting each one at the level they're at. So yeah, that's why I chose it. What was your other questions about well, it? Can you tell us what is, what is your definition? How would you describe what verbal working memory is? Yeah. And why it's important. Okay. Do you want me to show you? I would love that I... and, and talk us through your presentation. Okay. So yeah, this is my presentation. I'm glad I am able to just share it right here. So it was my final project 
And I talked a little bit about where I was placed this semester, which was with Genevieve here, Life Speech Pathology. Let's see. Okay, so what is verbal working memory? So verbal working memory involves the ability to remember something and to perform an activity using this memory. Um, it's a skill that allows us to maintain information in mind so that we can use it for learning, reasoning, or producing a result. It's responsible for temporarily storing information such as letters, words, numbers, or names. For example, this might involve shutting off a TV while remembering to gather your coat or your keys and bag before you leave the house. In school, it's important when you're taking notes, um, following multi-step directions, doing mathematical calculations in your head. And then it's also, it plays an important role in reading comprehension. And for younger children, it's also important for the development of decoding to create that reading fluency. Um, so yeah, it's a goal of the information that you hold in mind with the purpose of completing a task and helping to remember the rules for that. Um, so here I talk a, li a little bit about life participation approach to, um, so it's a person-centered service delivery model that supports people with aphasia and others such as caregivers, team members, um, whoever's affected by it to help them achieve their life goals. So a question that's important to keep in mind speech pathologists is how will this help the client reconnect with his or her life? And part of incorporating the life participation approach into treatment is considering the client's life and what they use language and communication for on a daily basis. So incorporating this approach into verbal working memory therapy included designing interventions around the patient's life interests, skills, goals, hobbies, and social participation. So who benefits from verbal working memory tasks? That would be anyone who experiences difficulty holding words or canonical sentences in memory. So typically these are people who have aphasia, apraxia, or other cognitive challenges after a stroke or other neurological events that would benefit, that's who would benefit from these tasks. So I used an example client that I've worked with over this, the past couple of months. 44, eight years post-stroke, I really wanted to talk about what his hobbies and interests were and show how I was able to use those interests when applying verbal working memory. So an example that I used was when we would look at a recipe and we would start off looking at a recipe, we, which one we want to talk about. Um, and then we get that process going. And then I would allow him to look over the recipe on his own and highlight the verbs. So we had preheat, whisk, add, fold, scoop, and bake. So once the verbs were chosen, he would use them to write sentences. And because his strength was in writing, he would type his sentence out first and then read it out loud. And then of course, depending on, you can switch that. You can have him say it out loud and then different strengths. So skimming through the steps and highlighting verbs is a skill that he's capable of, but it could possibly be too challenging for someone else and would require me to provide more support. But for this client, this is a task that he can do with minimal support. So once the verbs were highlighted, we would go through the steps together to make sure all of the verbs were selected. And then he would create his sentences. So when he creates a sentence, I gave a sentence such as bake it, I would ask him to expand on it and, you know, explain what's being baked. So bake the cookie. And then that's just, you know, just to expand on the sentence. And then from this point, we would establish maintenance by reading the sentence forward with and without looking. And this just engages processes such as storing, monitoring, and matching information. So once the sentences have been created, then we can increase the demand and start to manipulate them by putting the words in different orders. So we can put it in reverse, we can change the order of word, um, or we can order it by word length. So short to long, long to short, um, alphabetical or even reverse alphabetical. And so we do this to engage both the maintenance and manipulation processes such as reordering and updating information
sentence in reverse or alphabetical order is typically more difficult than reading the sentence in its original order. So once that maintenance is established, then we can incorporate manipulation and updating processes, and then we can establish maintenance again. Um, and so there's a lot of other ways that you can work on verbal working memory, such as creating sentences from a picture description task or creating sentences from a video of your grandchildren, um, even just weekend activities. So yeah, and then here's some of the evidence-based research um, that kind of just discuss that um, adults with aphasia typically present with working deficits um, that may contribute to their language processing difficulties. So according to Kaspari and other um, authors, there's a strong positive correlation between reading comprehension, language function, and with aphasia. Um, to comprehend language is predictable from their working memory capacities. And then Sung and other authors, their research supports that idea and determined that verbal working memory specifically is significantly correlated with the overall severity of aphasia, as well as listening and reading comprehension. And let's see what else I have. And then I kind of went into detail about the, it's based on a two-step mechanism, that's what, that's what the phonological loop is. And um, it consists of storage that can hold memory traces for a few seconds and an articulatory rehearsal process. So um, this visual, it demonstrates that this active process treats visual, um, visually presented verbal content into a phonological representation. It's maintained in phonation. And then unlike visual input, auditory input is directly stored in that phonological storage. And that's it. Zoe, that was great. Thanks. I love verbal workings like on the surface, you know, for somebody not in the speech pathology field, looking in from the outside, they might think it's such a, what is this? Why are you doing this? It, it's silly. But what we're trying to do is take a sentence that is so semantically, it, it has so much anchoring of semantics, of meaning. Right. And we're detaching that. So when you have to give a sentence in reverse, now you have to think of these individual word units, hold on to them, have the articulation pattern. Right. And go backwards. And then you go to, you return to the original sentence in between. And then you're adding kind of the semantics back in. But I always think that the semantics, once you detach it, mm -hmm. we're just working at word level. So now, even if we're at the original sentence level, the dog barks, bar barks, dog, the. Mm hmm even when we, once we detach that semantic meaning, we are just working on the phonological units. Yeah. We're working on articulation. And that's just a lot of brain power. So we can change it by length of sentence, how many words, mm -hmm. how many little words are in there. If there's like prepositions, we can right. have syllabic words. There's all sorts of ways to manipulate it. I think verbal working memory is just one of those skills everybody needs. Right. Yeah. And it's something that we work on pretty consistently with all of our folks, no matter what kind of aphasia they have. Yeah. Even if they have some apraxia or dysarthria, you know, all of that can be integrated in there. Exactly. Well, wonderful. Great presentation. I'm sure you've got an A on it. Did you get your grade yet? I did. I got a hundred. <laughs> All right. Woohoo. Well, no, nicely, very nicely done. Thank and you. I love that you picked that as a topic because I think clinicians, it's not something I learned in school. It's not, it's not even something yeah. I learned until I worked, started working with my mentor. And that was nine years ago. Wow. And I'm 29 years into the field. So it was wow. just one of those. Maybe it's taught now, but apparently not at NYU. I don't think nope. so because it's one of those subtle things. It's a, it's a yeah. subtle mental process. So I'm proud of you, Zoe. You have blossomed. I hate that word. Uh, <laughs> you have grown as a clinician. You came in with 
the hard skills, hard skills versus mm -hmm. soft skills. I'm talking about you knew how to learn evaluation measures and to give a test and write up a report. But what I really saw you grow in is how you established rapport with clients, how you maintained that rapport, how you were able to adjust your therapy methods, even if it's a working memory, make adjustments because people can vary day to day. Yeah. You, you picked up all those awesome soft skills that you get with time and experience and exposure. So yeah. it's been my, my pleasure to work with you this semester. You're going to do you. great in the profession, no matter what population you choose to work with. Thank you. Yeah. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed, I, I mean, I, I feel it too. Like I feel, I feel even just the confidence from when I started in February to now. So yeah. The, the time flies. Wow. Right. Any final words, Zoe? before we let you go. Just thank you. That's it. <laughs> it. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. So thank you for being a great student. This was a lot of fun this semester. And I wish you the best in you so your much. clinical career. It's going to be great. Yay. <laughs> thank you. All right, Zoe. Thanks. <laughs>